And I was just interested in what you thought about art in general, like what is art to you? And is art of medicine different from art in general? I think it is, and I think there's a way in which calling the art of medicine art degrades high art in a way, like there's some dangers, but you know, there's all sorts of meaning f meanings for art, and sometimes when people talk about the art of medicine, they mean it's the unscientific part, it's like a part that you can't really teach, and so it's a t t term of derision. Um, and then there's art as in like the artful dodger, you know, art is trickery, and so when you say a patient's able to behave artfully, that doesn't seem like a good thing either, although I think in a lot of ways it's good for patients to be able to act and present themselves in certain ways. And then there's high art, which almost by definition doesn't have practical utility. Now, I'm a little ambivalent about that kind of art too, because when you really boil it down to completely useless stuff, it's like the chair you can't sit in and the <laughs> ceramic vase that's too delicate to use, that's obviously not the art of medicine. Um, and there's art as, as craft, which is pretty close to the art of medicine, but, but I think we want to honor that and talk about craft at the highest level where, like architecture, right? No one's going to denigrate architecture, and yet you can live in, in a lot of buildings. It's there, they really have this wonderful role. And so when medicine is done well, and when I see a doctor interviewing a patient and they're both doing a great job at it, that to me has a lot of the emotional charge of high art because it's even interesting and beautiful to someone who's not involved, you know, who's not the patient. And part of the reason why so many novels and movies and, and operas have illness in it is because of that ability it has to reach other people who aren't directly involved. And that, I think, takes it beyond craft in the, in the lower sense. Mm -hmm. So I know that Harvard Medical School is doing uh, a narrative medicine round with mm -hmm. some of its uh, students. Um, do you feel like this is making a change, uh, a good change in, in medicine? And if so, like, do you, how do you feel other medical schools would, be, would feel about integrating this into their practice? Um, first, I have to like, get out of my preparation in each mode of thinking about this and say, you know, Harvard didn't invent that. Okay. <laughs> so it's not like Harvard can bring this to the rest of the world. And um, although you know, there have been a lot of great doctor writers from Harvard and so on. Um, but the second thing I have to do, obviously I'm a writer. I think writing is really important. I love books about illness. Um, and yet I'm a little bit suspicious of the narrative medicine goal, which is to get all the med students more, um, you know, more sensitive about death through reading the death of Ivan Ilyich or some, you know, 19th century short story uh, for a couple reasons. One is that the people that like that, the med students that benefit from it, they're already the people that are sort of sensitive and you know they're the psychiatrists and so forth. It's preaching to the converted. It doesn't help the people who are the ones people everyone perceives as needing it who are the sort of very procedure oriented surgeons or the dermatologist that wants, just wants to take your mole off and so forth. And I think there are ways of reaching that group who's suspicious of the notion of empathy and maybe rightly so. There's something about the way that narrative medicine privileges empathy that is a little suspect. Surgeons don't really respect empathy because they think it's better to cure someone's cancer than say, that must be really hard for you. And if they have only enough time to do one or the other, they're gonna take the cancer, you know, taking the lump out. Um, and they see empathy as something that, surgeon, that doctors do when they can't do anything else. Just a little mm. bit, it's a little bit true. So there's obviously some middle ground and I don't think narrative medicine will bring that middle ground to the unconverted. That being said, you know, for a lot of people, it's fun to have a book group where they take a story and see how it reflects on their life. Maybe my last cynical thing I'll say about that is that that process by which you take a great work of art and reinterpret it in terms of what it says about patient care or about the state of medicine today, it's a little degrading to that work of art as well. Often these are very, um, very subtle novels with a lot of amb ambiguities in them, and then to get them flattened by a bunch of doctors who've had like a certain agenda, that can be a little painful to watch. Now, I have to back up and say it's really wonderful, and I think everyone should read books and think about literature, but those are some of my worries. Um, so what do you think is the best way to approach uh, integrating art into medicine? I know 
I guess you're a big fan of writing. And do you feel like that is the best way because it's most as accessible to people? It is very accessible. It's something you can do in your armchair. Introverts can do it. It's, cer it's certainly what I feel most comfortable with. And I got more interested in theater, not because it was natural to me or because I had any theatrical background, but because it, I realized that was the stuff that I wasn't good at. I didn't know when do you put your hand on the patient's shoulder and when is that soothing and when is it invasive, you know, or um, what what do you, you know, just the, 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 it's all very well to feel pain, but how do you then help the patient through it? And so that action end of it was uh, something I didn't feel confident about. And I was actually thrilled when I was in med school, they didn't do this, but they now have a lot of exams with standardized patients, which are kind of weird, where a patient will pre pretend to have a, a, an actor, pretends to have, you know, a brain tumor or whatever. And then mm -hmm. eight med students come in over the course of a day and have a 20 minute interview with him and ask him questions about the brain tumor and say what they would do. Uh, and it's actually it's wonderful education. I wish I had had that. They get practice and they get immediate feedback, like maybe saying that is a little bit, you know, tasteless in this situation, or maybe you want to talk slower. Some of these very basic things that for us were never emphasized. It was all taught at a higher level, which wasn't always so useful. And then it's just amazing to see how the different students do things differently with exactly the same material. So that stuff, I think, is, is very educational. It's very... Um, moving for the people involved and um, it's also kind of expensive because you have to hire all those actors. So that's one of the downsides of the theater approach as opposed to the literature approach is it's just cumbersome and expensive. Mm -hmm. um, in a hypothetical world, do you, because technology is um, becoming increasingly more involved with medicine, a lot of the times doctors just go into the room and then work on their computer and don't really have eye contact with mm -hmm. the patient. So do you feel like there would ever be a situation in which the doctor role is completely replaced by actors and then the doctor just becomes a technician who does the work? I think to some extent that happens. I mean, not with actors, but for instance, nurse practitioners. A lot of times doctors will outsource their empathy to NPs who do the education and call you up and ask if you're still vomiting and stuff like that. Whereas the doctor is somebody who came in and did the surgery, for example. And for some doctors, it, you know, that's that's what they enjoy doing. And um, it's probably best that an NP does this empathy part because she may, she or he may do a better job. Uh, for other doctors, it's, it's terrible for them to lose that aspect of it. And I don't think um, they'll ever be completely pushed out of that arena. There's a lot of ways in which, say, a psychopharmacologist who is so upset because now he has these 20-minute med check meetings instead of an hour-long meeting where he can really get to know the patient. Um, doctors feel a lot of pressure that they can't do that. There's one thing I have to say is if they just earn a little less, they can still do that. They're feeling this pressure because they want to see 20 patients a day to mm -hmm. pay for their second home and their <laughs> and their summer, you know, their summer vacation and stuff. Mm -hmm. And at least currently, no doctor is suffering so much that that's really necessary. Now, um, you know, a lot of doctors aren't going to be buying that plan of mine. But I think okay. that part of the reason I have time for um, for spending more time with my patients is my kids go to public school and I don't have to pay all these extra tuitions. <laughs> that's cool. Um, so just in general, how do you see your work developing in the future years? You know, this is my excuse to, for why I don't really have a plan. I don't really have a plan for what's going to happen next. And my excuse is once I was at a conference for, um, it was f about uh, like alternative careers in medicine and it was me and like four other people who'd done something kind of weird rather than become chairman of their department. And somebody asked a guy who'd done this really interesting thing, you know, were you planning to end up in like Zimbabwe and doing this and that when you were going to medical school? And the guy was like, hell no. You know, I never thought of that at all. And the way I got here was I just did what seemed to be the most interesting at the time. And it led me in this really circuitous way to this thing that I never would have done if I had had a plan. And he said, I'm so glad I did not have a 10 year plan because I would have given up these opportunities and every other person on the panel was like, oh my God, that's me too. You know, I didn't have a 10 year plan. <laughs> and so I'm, I think I had a 10 year plan that I would use in interviews to tell people this is my 10 year plan, okay. but it was like bullshit. And so <laughs> I'm glad that I didn't really have one or at least that I was willing to abandon it. Um, and the bottom line is I don't really know what I'll be doing in 10 years. I think that's great. <laughs>
Um, I guess I'm looking forward to see to seeing what happens in the next 10 years. Um, thank you so much for sitting down for an interview. Um, look forward to seeing more of your work in the future. Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you.